This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'd like to thank the meeting organizers, uh, Chris and Linda and Mike, uh, for the kind invitation and for putting me to work today. Um, I have some research and educational grants paid to the university, uh, nothing personally, although I wish, and um, completely off-label use of devices, which is the theme of uh, my three talks in this session. Um, so iliac artery involvement, everybody knows, uh, uh, likely accounts for up to 30% of aortic aneurysm cases. Uh, treatment options, I think, have been popularized over the years, include um, obviously open repair, doing some sort of hypogastric artery uh, bypass to relocate uh, it, a hybrid extra anatomic approach to preserve internal iliac flow, and or EVAR with just hypogastric coiling. I think uh, these are all well-established um, techniques that everybody in the room has experience with. However, hypogastric artery embolization is uh, not without its potential complications. Uh, this was a paper uh, from nearly 15 years ago from Manny Mehta, who had actually uh, felt that um, coiling the hypo was a relatively somewhat innocuous procedure. And uh, this is where I beg to differ, and uh, perhaps we'll spend the next uh, 10 minutes uh, talking about that and why. So I think the sequelae of hypogastric embolization can include thigh and buttock claudication that's actually quite poorly reported in most of the clinical trials. Um, if you actually uh, sit down and carefully ask your patients about it, I'd probably say at this point nearly half of them will say that for some period of time, uh, six months to a year, have quite disabling buttock discomfort, particularly those that are younger and younger that were um, tend to be putting more and more stent grafts in. And I think that uh, that can be um, quite disabling from their daily walks. There is an incidence of up to 20 to 50 percent sexual dysfunction from coiling one of the hypos, particularly when the other side is occluded. Colonic ischemia is obviously uncommon, but is catastrophic when it does happen. And in fact, in large registry series, colonic ischemia um, probably happens in about 1 to 2 percent of EVAR uh, and typically is related to lack of hypogastric flow. Uh, buttock necro you know, some of these more fantastic pictures of buttock necrosis and scrotal skin sloughing, you know, again, are extremely rare, but when they happen, catastrophic. And then certainly with the interest in what we heard about in the first session uh, of uh, more and more um, thoracoabdominal uh, type endovascular approaches, keeping the hypogastric in circulation is probably a good idea long term. So here are some of the... Um, here are some of the endovascular options for hypogastric preservation during EVAR. So obviously you could do a bypass as a hybrid type procedure to relocate the hypo to a lower part of the external iliac. You can do anti-grade hypogastric stenting in a fem-fem, which is the so-called banana technique. Um, and this winds up looking like a banana because of the, because of the external to internal, typically self-expanding covered stent. Uh, that curves over and looks like that. And then obviously closing off of flow coming down that side requires a fem-fem with um, retrograde perfusion up the external to fill that hypo. And then typically a blocker onto that side. Uh, here's another uh, sort of picture of that, again highlighting the need for the fem-fem and retrograde flow. Uh, manufactured branch and fenestrated devices uh, popularized uh, throughout uh, uh, some of the clinical trials uh, that I'll highlight soon. Uh, Surgeon-modified bifurcated devices. Uh, these are some um, uh, ways to do it sort of on the back table, although now somewhat poo-pooed unless you have an IDE. Uh, the trifurcated graft technique um, championed by Dave Minion from Kentucky uh, that basically involves uh, using uh, two main bodies and coming from the arm uh, 
uh, to cannulate down the contralateral gate of the second main body in order to uh, uh, place a covered stent down into the internal iliac. And then uh, the sandwich technique, uh, which was uh, a part of the title of the talk, which uh, we've also uh, called double barrel. You could do that from the arm or from, or from up and over. And that typically involves then placing two parallel stent grafts inside one of the limbs to perfuse the internal and, and external. Uh, we have written about this in terms of trying to calculate um, the diameters that you need in order to fill uh, the hole, and the formula is the pi d plus n d, n being the number of barrels that you want to put inside of a limb. Um, and this was, a, this was a paper I worked on with some UCLA colleagues combining our experience presented at the Western Vascular several years back on um, uh, doing an up and over technique uh, utilizing the advantage of the endologics device that sits on the aortic bifurcation uh, in order to do the double barrels through their short um, common iliac limbs and then placing uh, basically uh, uh, bilateral covered stents uh, in a uh, sandwich configuration inside the bottom of the limb. Obviously, um, there are companies uh, that are that are uh, that are actively or that are actively engaged in clinical trials currently. Both Cook and Gore have. Um, their iliac branch devices, uh, Cooks has been used extensively outside the U.S. for nearly a decade. Um, there are some limitations to the device, mainly sort of the anatomic features that I'll get into in a second. And this was, uh, we've been fortunate enough to implant uh, five of these in the Cook trial. Um, and uh, currently there were four, 58 implants in the current sort of Preserve 1 trial. Preserve 2 included a modification to add the ICAST stent as, as the bridging stent. And the, the 40 patients for Preserve 2 was completed last week, uh, and uh, we are eagerly awaiting uh, continued access and the uh, final results of that. Uh, Gore's trial was IBE 1204, uh, 50 sites, um, and uh, 60 patients have been enrolled, uh, and now we're in the continued access, and uh, we were fortunate to, 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 have, to have implanted uh, uh, five of each of these devices uh, at our institution. Uh, this is what the typical uh, uh, um, bilateral common iliac aneurysm uh, looks like coiling of one side, the branch device uh, goes into position, uh, and up and over a sheath to get access down through the contralateral gate, and then a hypogastric branch uh, uh, stent, stent graft down into the internal iliac. So the first audience participation. You have a patient with a six centimeter aneurysm with a four centimeter iliac aneurysm. Uh, with the other hypogastric occluded. So I'm just curious what the room would do, uh, and it's A through G. Uh, open repair, EVAR with embolization, a banana, which is the external iliac plus fem fem, double barrel sandwich, parallel, Brazilian, whatever you want to call that, uh, trifurcated, which is the two main bodies, access, or uh, click F if you have access to the clinical trial device, which would mean that you're in continued access, or whether you would homemade one, home make one. I was just curious what the room would do. I guess the choice here should have been do, do nothing either, so. Okay, let's see. So, looks like uh, still popular open repair. Um, not a lot of people would embolize, and a lot of people would do the banana technique, the, the, the external to internal bypass with a fem-fem. Uh, parallel endografting, uh, popular. Uh, trifurcated, uh, popular, uh, and then the handful that would home make. Good. Okay, so it seems like we're set then in uh, patients with, with iliac an, you know, aneurysm, should we uh, get these uh, both uh, uh, Gore and Cook's device approved in the near future. And this should probably, hopefully, work for everybody. But like all things, um, there are issues. And so this is a paper we just published uh, this month in Annals. Uh, this is some work I did. Uh, with the Birmingham guys, and we looked at uh, both institutions, um, uh, so aneurysm registry, and found 100 patients that had iliac aneurysms concomitant with, uh, with an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And then we applied uh, the, the, the inclusion and, and exclusion criteria uh, for both, uh, both trials to see real world uh, how many would have fit into those trials. And it turns out uh, this is the number of exclusions that each patient has. Again, it's 99 patients with common iliac aneurysms. 
and um, the minority of them have no exclusions, meaning the minority of them actually would have fit into the IFU uh, for being included in, into the trials. And in fact, many of them had multiple, multiple exclusions. So if you look at the 99 aneurysms, actually only 18 fit into the Cook trial. Of those 18, only eight would have also fit into the Gore trial. Of the 81 that were excluded from the Cook trial, 17 would have fit into the Gore trial. The other way around, 99 aneurysms, actually 25 fit into the Gore. It's that same eight that fit into both trials. Of the 74 excluded from the Gore, 10 would have fit into the Cook trial. So to summarize this paper, 18% were eligible for the Cook iliac branch, which only improved to 29% when you added on Preserve 2, remember, which was using the ICAS stent. 25%, a quarter, were eligible for the Gore trial, and overall, only a third eligible if you happen to be fortunate enough to have access to both trials. The main reasons, the hypogastric landing zone excluded nearly a third for the Gore device, excluded two-thirds for the Cook device, slightly improved in Preserve 2 because of the use of the ICAS stent. And really, the main reason for the Gore exclusion, common iliac length and diameter. So we still have some work to do in terms of designing the right device for these. So I want to go back to the trifurcated technique because then what I'll, what I'll present to you in the last few minutes here is then what I've done uh, with the patients that don't fit into either trial. Um, so the trifurcated technique, as, I, as, as, as most people have experience with, is a main body up to the aorta, another main body with a bridging piece, typically or classically described as using arm access to come from the, from the arm to get into contrahypo. A um, couple of years ago, Mark Farber was visiting, and we kind of came up with a different way to do it so you could do it all from both groins. And that was the concept of this preloaded wire, which the trial devices have, have access to. And we had showed this at the Western Vascular as a case report a couple of years back. So this was our patient, a five and a half centimeter aneurysm, 4.4 right common iliac, 3.2 left common iliac. The hypo on the right was 24. Uh, so we elected to cork off that side, and we were going to try to preserve into this 3.2 left common iliac aneurysm. So here's up and over to coil the right hypo. And then now to, to sort of deliver this, an 18 French sheath uh, goes up the left side that we're going to try to put this bifurcated device in. And then inside of that then comes the smallest, uh, smallest C3 device. And that is opened up and withdrawn so that the contragate is deployed above where the, uh, where the origin of the hypogastric is. You puncture the 18 French sheath to get an additional wire that's your preloaded wire and come out the end of the 18 French sheath and into the opening of the, of the, um, of the, of, of the contragate and get that up and then obviously uh, now you have two wires, the one through the main body and the one out the 18 French sheath through the contra device. You snare this preloaded wire so that you've got this through and through wire and then that way that allows you to drag this 12 French sheath through the device and down into the, down into the contra origin so that now you've got a much uh, more favorable angle and straighter shot to cannulate the internal iliac on that side. Also, some of the advantage of the fact that it's a C3 is that you can close this off, move it around, twist it around, which with, uh, suprarenal, devi or with suprarenal fixated devices would be a little more challenging. Um, so now that you have got this through and through wire, it, then it easily allows you to be able to drive a stiffer wire down into place. You can use an ICAST long one uh, that basically, remember the stent can be, uh, can, can be angioplasty to a larger size. You place the nine, you take a 14 balloon to mate it into the contra gate, and then you have a seal there. And then obviously you finish the rest of it like a, like a trifurcated a bell bottom piece to extend down into there, and that's what your final picture looks like. We've done uh, uh, about half a dozen of these and, and just some sort of tips and tricks. You have to have the right length. The iliac length has, or, um, uh, this, this, this aorta to hypo length has to be 170 to make all the math and the pieces add up. So here are the pitfalls. This is one we tried on a little shorter one. And unfortunately, you'll, you'll see in the, in the sequence of pictures, the device is up too high. And even with the through and through wire, I was not able to drag a 12 French sheath with this somewhat gothic arch of the aortic bifurcation uh, to do that. So the lessons learned certainly are the key measurements are this aorto hypogastric length. The common iliac probably should be about 50 or 55 to make this work. And the common iliac diameter has to be wide enough to accommodate the fact that you're putting a main body in there. 
The through and through wire, I think, is key for these. The 12 French Anshul sheet that Cook's makes, Cook makes, I think, is the best sheet to deliver an up and over uh, a, a stent graft. And then, obviously, you still have the arm access options. So in conclusion, uh, preservation of the hypogastric, I think, is important for all the reasons that I outlined. I think that iliac branch technology and the clinical trial devices will provide an on-label platform for uh, repair in the future. I think the current clinical trial criteria are, are strict and uh, lead only to about a third of the patients uh, um, being able to be treated. And obviously, we need to continue to sort of innovate both device and technique-wise uh, towards improved clinical outcomes. Thanks for your time. Thank you.